Greetings in the matchless name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Today we will be covering Exodus chapter 7 and this forms the basis for lesson number 7. Now if you have not read and reread the material then may I humbly suggest that you stop this recording and open your Bibles and read the relevant material and then meditate on it and then come back to this recording. If you are starting fresh on the Exodus series then may I humbly suggest once again that you start with lesson 0 and then go on to lesson 1, lesson 2a, 2b and so on and then work your way up gradually before you listen to this recording. Now when you look at the first six chapters of Exodus you'll find that they are more concerned with the person of the deliverer which is Moses. But starting with Exodus chapter 7 going through up to Exodus chapter 13 we find that the work of redemption is the clear focus of these chapters. So we see a shift from the person of the deliverer to the focus on redemption. Now you find that when you, we ended chapter 7, it closed with uh, the Lord's servant Moses bemoaning the spiritual hopelessness of his task. Uh, thus the weakness of the instrument was fully manifested so that everyone could understand that the power of deliverance came from Jehovah alone. Now starting with this chapter, we'll observe that Moses is no more timid. He is no more hesitant or discouraged. Rather, as the events unfold, we see that Moses, God's servant, becomes God's spokesman and he becomes God's mouthpiece with the Lord putting into his lips the very words he would utter. Now the gauntlet has been thrown down and it is an open war between the Almighty and the Egyptian Pharaoh. A thrilling drama of the conflict of good versus evil unfolds before our eyes. And when the whole saga ends, we find that God reigns supreme. We also see, starting with this chapter, that God's strategy for deliverance. Now, way back in Exodus chapter 3, when we had looked at it, and verses 19 and 20, God had clearly indicated what was the purpose of the plagues. And I shall quote those verses for your convenience. Exodus chapter 3, verses 19 and 20 go this way. And I, the I there is God, am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not by a mighty hand. And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof. And after that, he will let you go. Now for 80 years, or probably a little longer than that, the Egyptians had oppressed the Hebrews. But now the time was ripe for God to act. In Psalm 103 and verse 8, we have a beautiful verse which goes this way. The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger and plenteous in mercy. You see, God was going to take vengeance on those who oppressed his people. But before he executed vengeance, God displayed his mercy. So too you will find that in the end times we see the mercy of God over and over again. But one fine day the days of mercy will come to an abrupt end and the day of God's unmitigated wrath will begin. My friend I want to assure you today that the Lord's delays are not his denials. I'll repeat that again. The Lord's delays are not his denials. Now that the Pharaoh had established that he would not heed God's demands, God in judgment sends ten plagues on Egypt. And if you look at it, the plagues increase in the severity of their judgment. Almost all of the ten plagues are aimed directly at one of the Egyptian gods. We will notice that the first three plagues affected both Israel and Egypt equally. You see, the water which was available was all turning into blood. And it teaches us something today too, that all have merited the wages of sin. And the wages of sin is death. You see, all are impacted by sin. And this sin, if you really think about it, bringeth forth death universally. In the second plague, we find that there are an abundance of frogs and frogs are depicted in the Bible in Revelation 16 to typify unclean spirits. 
And this once again was an indication that even today all are subject to the debasing influence of Satan and none are spared from the wiles of the devil. In plague number three, we find that the dust has been turned into lice, which affected all and caused great discomfort. And this once again tells us that way back in Genesis, man was made from the dust of the earth. And after the fall, the ground was cursed. This tells us that even today, all are under the curse and under judgment, just like Pharaoh ex experienced the judgment wherein the dust was turned into lice. Now in the last seven plagues, we'll see that God makes a clear distinction, showing his superiority over the gods of the heathen. The ten plagues, if you think about it in their appropriate order, are as follows. In plague number one, the waters of the Nile and the waters everywhere else, even whether they are in the basins or in uh, vessels, turned into blood. In other words, any standing water turned into blood. In plague number two, we find that frogs covered the land, and you find that in Exodus chapter 8. And in plague number three, it was the attack of the lice that covered the body and caused great discomfort. You find that in Exodus chapter 8, verses 16 through 19. In plague number four, you find that the land is devastated by a swarm of flies which invaded the homes of the Egyptians. And you find it in verses 20 through 24 of Exodus 8. And in the fifth plague, you find that a grievous disease smites the cattle of the Egyptians. And you find that in the first seven verses of Exodus chapter 9. Then you find that boils and uh, sores were sent upon both man and beast. And you find that in Exodus chapter 9 verses 8 through 12. In plague number seven, you find that there is a striking of thunder and hail which strikes Egypt. And you find it in verses 18 through 35 of Exodus 9. In plague number eight, you'll find that there is an attack of the locusts that consumes all the vegetation. And you find it in the first 20 verses of Exodus chapter 10. In plague number nine, you find that there is a thick darkness that enveloped the land for three days. You find it in verses 21 through 29 of Exodus 10. And the, finally, the last plague resulted in the firstborn of man and beast being slain. And you find that in Exodus chapter 11 and 12. Much can be learned from these plagues. When you look at their order, their arrangement, their number, their purpose, and their effects. Let's start out by looking at their purpose. As far as I can see, there are at least five purposes mentioned. The first purpose that I can think of was they gave a public manifestation of the mighty power of the Lord God. In fact, you find that in Exodus chapter 9 and verse 16, this is the mention of the verse says this way, and in very deed for this cause have I, the I there is God, raised thee up. For to show in thee my power, and that my name may be declared throughout all the earth. Eventually, when the magicians could not reduplicate the miracles displayed by Moses, you will find that they too turn course, and they exclaim in Exodus chapter 8 and verse 19, Then the magicians said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. I'll repeat that again. This is the is the finger of God. A second purpose I can think of was that this was a divine visitation of wrath for the Egyptians' cruel treatment of the Hebrews for these past 80 plus years. God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, said the Lord. And you find that in Exodus, in, uh, sorry, in Romans chapter 12 and verse 19. Eventually, even the Pharaoh admitted in Exodus chapter 10 and verse 16, and this is what he had to say. I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. And yet you find that he still hardens his heart. A third purpose that I can think of is that it was the judgment from God against all the gods of Egypt. Now, two verses bear this out in absolute clarity. In, in verse number 12 of Exodus chapter 12, you will find this verse quoted this way. <clears throat> 
For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and I will smite all the firstborn of the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Note that point. Against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. Pretty much the same thing is reiterated in verse 4 of Numbers 33. There you find the verse goes this way. For the Egyptians buried all their firstborn, which the Lord had smitten among them. Upon their gods also the Lord executed judgments. So we find that a third purpose was for this was it was a judgment from God against the gods of Egypt. A fourth purpose that I can think of is it demonstrated that Jehovah was high above all gods. You see, they were a solemn warning. These plagues were a solemn warning to other nations that God would curse those who cursed Israel. And these points are made further evident when we consider the following scriptural verses that makes this very clear. In verses 10 and 11 of Exodus chapter 18, you find Jethro, the father-in-law of Moses, saying this way. And Jethro said, Blessed be the Lord who had delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of Pharaoh, who had delivered the people from under the hand of the Egyptians. Now I know that the Lord is greater than all gods. For in the thing wherein they dealt proudly, he was above all of them. <coughs> Excuse me. You find this in God's promise to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12 and verse 3. And there it says, And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curse thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. The effect of this solemn warning and all the mighty acts of God on behalf of his people Israel you will find caused Rahab years later to believe in the God of Israel. Because you find her response in, Genesis, in Joshua chapter 2 and verse 11, where she says, For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. Years later after that, the mighty acts that God did on behalf of the Israelites were not forgotten. They remained in history, because you find that the Philistines say the same thing in 1 Samuel chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. And this is how they stated it. And the Philistines were afraid, for they said, God is come into the camp. And they said, Woe unto us, for there hath not been such a thing heretofore. Woe unto us, who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues and in the wilderness. A fifth purpose I could find of is that these miraculous plagues were evidently designed as a series of testings or trials, if you want to call it. Testings or trials for Israel to know that God is God. And it's taught in Deuteronomy chapter 4 verses 34 and 35. And there it goes this way. This is Moses speaking there and he says, Or hath God assayed to go and take a nation from the midst of another nation by trials, by signs, and by wonders, and by war, and by a mighty hand, and by a stretched out arm, and by great terrors, according to all that the Lord your God did for you in Egypt before your eyes? Unto thee it was showed that thou mightest know that the Lord, he is God. There is none else beside him. Re repeat that again. That thou mayest know that the Lord, he is God. There is none else beside him. You see, although the trials in Egypt were difficult to bear, when Israel experienced deliverance at the Red Sea, it was a redeemed nation of Israel which could sing with their whole heart. And their song is recorded in Exodus chapter 15. And verse 11 goes this way. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, 
doing wonders so my friend so shall the believer who overcomes trials on this earth with Christ's help he too will sing one day the same song of deliverance which Israel sang and we too will say thou might as know that the Lord he is God there is none beside him now when we look at the arrangement of these plagues you'll find that these plagues manifest divine order and a divine design and if you take uh, the 10th plague it stands by itself and it is separated from the other nine plagues because of its special relation to Israel and their redemption but when we consider the first nine plagues you'll find that these nine plagues are arranged in groups of three creating three separate divisions now you'll find that a warning preceded in each instance of the first and second plagues in each group but you'll find that there is no warning given when the third plague in each group is executed now the you'll find that the third plague in each group happens all of a sudden suddenly thus we notice that the third plague where the dust becomes light the sixth plague where the ashes of the furnace becomes boils upon man and beast and the ninth plague where the land is covered in utter thick darkness we see that no announcement is given to pharaoh and it happens suddenly i should also note that the signs that commenced each group of three in other words plague number 1 plague number 4 and plague number 7 they are the first plagues in each of those three groups were all announced in advance to pharaoh in the morning and when you look at the signs which ended each group as in other words plague number 3 plague number 6 and plague number 9 they were all carried out without any announcement or warning being given we also find that this sudden judgment as in plagues 3 6 and 9 where no warning is given is telling us that it is a sure fire reminder that god will not always strive and that warning if it has been repeated and it has been unheeded will be followed by judgment which will be sudden and terrible i want to take this and now uh, look at that book of revelation you will find that there too you will have three groups of judgment that fall upon the earth there you find the groups of the judgment are in the form of the opening of the seals the blowing of the trumpets and the pouring out of the vials of wrath they are all designed to show that god is sovereign and that the world is ripe for judgment you see what we see in egypt is but a pale shadow of what will take place in the future just like god gave pharaoh an opportunity to change his heart and change his mind so too god gives man an opportunity to repent from their sins and gives them a warning to turn to god from idols and to serve the living and true god we are asked explicitly to wait for his son from heaven whom god raised from the dead even jesus who delivered us from the wrath to come i also want you to observe an introversion in the order of the plagues pay special attention we are going to do a small introversion when you look at the first plague and the 10th plague you will find that the first plague waters of the nile turn into blood this is a symbol of death in the 10th plague you will find that there is actual blood shedding in the death of the first born so in both plagues plague number 1 and plague number 10 there is death and the symbol of death and then death itself now when you take the next introversion you look at plague number 2 and plague number 9 when you look at the second plague you find that frogs are the creatures of the night and these are the creatures of darkness that they came forth and what do you see in the ninth plague you will find that there is actual darkness over all of egypt if you look at the next introversion group which would be plague number 3 and plague number 8 in plague number 3 you will find that after plague number 3 happens the magicians are not able to reduplicate that effort and they are forced to exclaim this is the finger of god 
When you get to the eighth plague, you'll find that Pharaoh says, after that plague happens, I have sinned against the Lord your God. But when you think about Pharaoh, it is unfortunate that it always remained your God as far as Pharaoh was concerned. When you look at the next group, which would be the fourth plague and the seventh plague, you will find that in the fourth plague, God specifically exempted the land of Goshen. No swarms of flies shall be there. Exodus 8.22 and you will find the same specific mention happening in the seventh plague. Only in the land of Goshen, there will be no hail. And final group would be the fifth plague and the sixth plague. In those two plagues, you will find that the cattle of the Egyptians were attacked. Now I want to look at the progressive nature of the plagues. As I said earlier, if I had mentioned, if I had not mentioned it here, I'm mentioning it once more, is that there is a marked gradation, a steady advance in the severity of the divine judgments. In the first set of three plagues, you will find that it, those set of three plagues, the first set of three plagues, merely interfered with the comfort of the Egyptians. But you will also find that the first three plagues also interfered with the comfort of the Israelites. You see, Israel also experienced the same discomfort which the Egyptians experienced. Let's take a, take a quick look at those three plagues. Plague number one, you'll find that they are deprived of water to drink. You see, water everywhere, it's not just in Egypt, but also in Goshen, everywhere turned into blood. It tells of how death broods this earthly scene. It also tells us that sin is universal and all are under sin and the wages of sin is death. In plague number two, you'll find that there are the frogs which invaded the homes causing a severe nuisance value. The invasion of frogs which typify unclean spirits. It tells us that today none is spared from the uncleanness of sin. You'll find this in Revelation 16 where you'll find that the frogs and unclean spirits being mentioned in the same verse. Frogs are also known to inflate themselves and this suggests that man by nature is proud and he is puffed up in our own ways. When you think about Pharaoh, it was Pharaoh's pride which caused his downfall. The same thing is what happened with Satan. It was pride which entered the heart of Satan which caused his downfall. In plague number three, with the lice attacking the person causing severe itch and discomfort, you find that the invasion of lies typifies the effects of sin, which is corruption. It speaks of uncleanness and filth which issue from the lusts of the flesh. Now you find that both Israel and Egypt experienced these three plagues, indicating that Israel was subject to the same basic effects of sin as the Egyptians. None was any better. But when you get to the second set of three plagues, you find that God's hand was laid on the possessions of the Egyptians. In the first set, it just merely interfered with the comfort of the Egyptians and the Israelites. But in the second set of plagues, you'll find that the three plagues, God's hand is laid on the possessions of the Egyptians. Here we see that Israel in the land of Goshen was exempted from these three plagues. Because in Exodus 8, 22 and 23, you will read it this way. And I will sever, and the I there is God, will sever in that day the land of Goshen in which my people dwell, that no swarms of flies shall be there. To the end thou mayest know that I am the Lord in the midst of the earth, and I will put a division between my people and thy people. Tomorrow shall this sign be. When you look at plague number four, you find that flies corrupted their land, and these flies spoil the food, they spread disease. And if you think about Beelzebub, Beelzebub was the fly god and this talks about how the wicked are corrupt in nature just like the, their father the devil and this devil is also known as Beelzebub the prince of demons in Matthew 12 24.
In plague number five, there you find there is a grievous moraine of cattle which saw many cattle destroyed. When you think about the cattle, the cattle is a beast of burden. And this tells us that the service of the natural man is corrupted at its very source. In plague number six, you will find that boils are caused body harm on both man and beast. And this reminds us that the unregenerate is presented in Isaiah 1.6 in the following way. For the, from the sole of the foot, even unto the head, there is no soundness in it, but wounds and bruises and putrefying sores. They have not been closed, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. Now when we get to the third set of plagues, you will find that the third set of plagues brought desolation and death. And this is plainly evidenced by the direct hand of God acting now. In plague number seven, you will find that the hail destroys vegetation and cattle. This again tells us that the wrath of God abideth on the disobedient. In plague number eight, you will find that the locusts, there is a locust attack and the locusts destroy all the vegetation left behind by the hail. This speaks to us of spiritual barrenness of this world. That this world is a desolate waste so far as the soul is concerned. And in plague number nine, you find that darkness, a thick darkness enveloped the land. And this stopped all activity throughout the land, causing much loss as the economy came to us absolute standstill. This darkness tells us that the world is alienated from him who is the light of the world. And then finally, when you think about the final plague, it tells us about the second death which awaits all whose hearts are hardened against God. And they too will meet the same end as the Pharaoh of old. Now for a brief period, I want to look at the effects of these plagues. When you think about these plagues, these plagues were designed to establish the faith of the Israelites. You see, the Lord through the plagues shows everyone the existence and the omnipotence of the true God in heaven, in contrast to the impotency of the false gods of Egypt. In these plagues, you find the presence and power of Jehovah were clearly demonstrated so that he stood discovered to his people as the living God. These plagues also will cause the Egyptians to know that the God of Israel is Jehovah and they will learn his absolute power and authority. Now through the plagues, God himself revealed himself as the Lord God, the ever-present God to help his children in times of trouble. You see, this is displayed by the fact that many of the judgments were against the false confidences and idolatrous objects of the Egyptians. Let me give you some examples. In the first sign shown to Pharaoh, we find that Moses, or, or rather we find that Aaron cast his rod before Pharaoh and it becomes a serpent. Pharaoh is therefore the first man to see a servant of God perform a miracle. You see, the Egyptians worshipped the serpent God. Now Aaron's rod transformed into a serpent, we find, swallowed the rods which turned into serpent of the Egyptian magicians. This signifying that their gods were unable to save them from the forthcoming storm. When you think about the, second, uh, the, the next plague where the water is turned into blood, there you find that the river Nile is an object treated with profound veneration by the Egyptians. The water turned into blood caused the water to become a stench of death and pollution. When you think about the next plague, which was the frogs, you find that the frogs were an emblem of the goddess of fecundity, of fruitfulness, of fertility. So it was considered a sacrilege to destroy a frog. Yet these very same frogs become a major nuisance when the second plague is in effect. Now just as the frogs were unclean, so too you'll find that Satan's work is one of uncleanness. When you think about the magicians, they were also able to counterfeit the frogs. But we see that they are unable to remove the frogs. 
And this is why Pharaoh had to turn to Moses and ask for help to stop the plague. Because the magicians could not remove the frogs. This highlights an important point that the alleviation of human suffering is no part of the program of the devil and his agents. They can only add to human misery. But relief can come only through Jehovah. And it is Jehovah who answers the believing cry of his saints and his servants. When you think about the plague of lies, you find that it is a known fact that Egyptians could not approach the sacred altars of Egypt upon whom such an impure insect like a lice harbored. The Egyptian priests, in fact, in order to guard themselves against having any lice, they wore only white linen garments and they cleanly shaved their heads. The Egyptians were scrupulously clean in their personal habits. When one examines the effect of this plague on the Egyptians, we will realize that, that as long as the lice lasted on the body, no act of worship to their false gods could be performed. This is what led the magicians to exclaim and state, This is the finger of God. When you think about the plague of flies, there you find that it was designed to destroy the trust of the Egyptian people in Beelzebub, the fly god. And in the fifth plague where cattle are consumed and destroyed, it was aimed at destroying the system of brute worship, where cattle in the form of a sacred bull or a ram or a heifer or a goat were all actively widely worshipped by the Egyptians. This clearly makes an impression even on the Israelites because years later you find that this system of worshipping these cattle and bulls and things like that came back to haunt the Israelites because years later when Moses went up into the mount and the Israelites clamoured with Aaron to make them a god, the end product was a golden calf. And how did that come, golden calf come about? It came all the way from Egypt. Evidently, this system of worship had never gone out of the mind of the Israelites. Now I want to briefly look at the conduct of the magicians. Now one question which, is, uh, which any reasonable student might ask, which will automatically arise in every child of God who thinks about this incident in the lives of the Israelites is this question. How did the magicians duplicate the first two miracles? Well, in Revelation chapter 16, verses 13 and 14 provides the answer. And I'll read that those two verses for you of convenience. It goes this way. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Now note this sentence. For they are the spirits of devils working miracles. What is that again? For they are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of Almighty. For those who deny that Satan, there are some who deny that Satan cannot do supernatural miracles. These two verses especially that line, for they are the spirits of devil working miracles, must make anybody who thinks that Satan cannot do supernatural miracles should make them realize that, that they are living in denial of the power of Satan to imitate the works of God. Now you'll find that the magicians acting in the names of the gods ultimately were no match for Jehovah. They could only duplicate the first two miracles, but when it came to the lies, they were unable to reduplicate it. Now, there are three things that the magicians did which is very significant. First thing which they did was they changed the rods into serpent. That tells us and speaks to us about satanic power. They also turned the water into blood. That speaks of death. They were also able to bring forth frogs in abundance speaks of pride and uncleanness. Now these three imitations shows the real character of Satan's works and the limits of his abilities. 
compared to God in that Satan was unable to reduplicate the fourth miracle of turning dust into lice where life had to be brought forth from the dust of the ground. When you think about the devil, the Bible says that the devil is an imitator. This is demonstrated in the three miracles that the magicians imitated. We see this point also demonstrated in the parable that the Lord Jesus said of the tares. You find that in Matthew's Gospel chapter 13 verses 24 and 25. And there it goes this way. Another parable put he, the he there is Jesus, put, put he forth unto them saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. What was the problem with the tares? The tares looked exactly like the wheat which was sown. And only when they grew up did the tares manifest themselves as the weeds. And the wheat grew up to be the good wheat. And this tells us that when brute force in the form of increased labors to the Hebrews fails, and that's what happened when you think about the Hebrews, when they started out, Pharaoh put rigorous uh, labors on them and it failed to control the population. And when that fails, you find that Satan goes to the next ploy, which is the magicians under the devil's control imitate the miracles performed by Moses. And this should teach us the following principles. The first principle it should teach us is that Satan opposes first by force. We see that in the increased persecution of the Hebrews. The Bible says in 1 Peter 5, 8 that the devil is like a roaring lion. The lion has great power. So Satan tries to use that power to his advantage. And when this brute force failed, and then the plan of persecution is foiled, then the devil resorts to subtler means and employs his wiles to deceive. And this we see in the imitation tricks of the magicians. You see, Satan often resorts to trickery, black magic, to achieve his ways. When you think back in the Garden of Eden, we find that there the devil used the cunning of the serpent, Genesis 3.1, to accomplish his goal. In fact, 2 Corinthians 11.14 says that Satan appears as an angel of light. So this is why it is absolutely important that every student of God and every child of God should have the spirit of discernment so that we can rightly judge the word of truth. In, Tim, in 2 Timothy 3.8, we are in fact told the identity of two of the magicians who were working for Pharaoh and we are told that their names were Janus and Jambres because there we read Janus and Jambres withstood Moses. When we think about how they withstood Moses we will observe some things. You see they withstood Moses not by imprisoning Moses or by killing Moses or by having Moses thrown out of the palace Rather, they withstood Moses by duplicating Moses' works. My friend, if you think about it, even today there are plenty of Janus and Jambres floating around. They are often plying their trade to ensnare the gullible and simple-minded folks. Their chief, their chief appeal is not their message or the glory of Christ. Rather, their God is their bellies. And the prosperity gospel preachers of our time who fly around in three or four personal planes, who live in million dollar mansions and have gold plated staircases and have every kind of opulence fitted in their homes while shamelessly pleading with the gullible on television to ignore paying their utility bills, to have their utility cut off, but send money into the coffers of these uh, prosperity gospel preachers and th with the promise that God will bless them a hundredfold they are prime examples of modern day Janus and Jambres. Now you'll find that Moses was vindicated in the end so too the Lord Jesus will vindi be vindicated in the end time when he will appear as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords.
Revelation 19 verses 11, 15 and 16 bear that fact out in absolute clarity. Finally, when I am on the subject of the magicians, I must emphasize that believers are warned to keep well clear of all spiritist activities. Chances, mediums, users of tarot cards, astrologers with their charts, and many others claim that they can predict the future or even what lies beyond death. It has been my view that much of this is the work of opportunistic charlatans. I have met a few in my lifetime who have told me that they can predict my future if I am willing to part with $5 or $10. But when I simply turn around and tell them, you know what, I don't want to know about my future, but guess what, I'll give you double the money if you can tell me accurately what happened to me yesterday or what happened to me on a specific day in the past, they refuse to take me up on my offer. Yet they know everything about my future, but they cannot tell me about the past about which I know about my past. Even so, my friend, it is important for us to be aware that the devil is actively at work and he does have powers and he will use them from time to time to deceive and delude men and women who are gullible. You see, Moses in his day confronted them and he showed them their limitations because Moses was Jehovah's chosen servant. The fact that these vessels of the devil appear to do what is supernatural does not mean that their work is of God. May we have the spirit of discernment to decide what is right and what is wrong and our word of God will guide us and telling us what is right and what is wrong. I also want to look at the age of Moses. We see that when Moses and Aaron are called by God to do the most important work of their lives, they are at an advanced age. We find that Moses is 80 years old and Aaron is 83 years old. This tells me that some are called into service and prepared by God when they are young but some are called into service when they are old. Why do I say that? When you look at Genesis 41-46, you will find that Joseph was only 30 years old when he was elevated to that high office in Egypt. When I think of Jeremiah, I feel he was probably in his late teens because if you look at Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 6, he says, I am but a child. But when he was called into service, we find that he was very young. But when we look at Moses and Aaron, we find that they are used after a large part of their life is gone. The great F.B. Meyer was called for the most important work he had to do after he had turned 66 years old. Let this fact encourage all who may consider that their best years of service is long gone and their work for the Lord is all done, that if God calls you, the time God calls you is the best time. There yet is service that he would have you to do. And he gives it. And he will give you, if he gives it to you, he will also give you the necessary strength to carry it out. The Lord chooses his servants and chooses them in his own time. Let me repeat that again. The Lord chooses his servants and chooses them in his own time. Finally, this chapter ends with the first plague. Let's take a brief look at the first plague. While studying this plague, we'll notice that Moses and Aaron have to meet Pharaoh in the morning as he goes out to the Nile. As I told you before, the Nile was regarded as the lifeline of Egypt and the god of the annual flood was known as H-A-P-Y, happy. In the first group of plagues, God is teaching the Egyptians a lesson. And that lesson was, thou shall know that I am the Lord. And why is that lesson being taught? It is being taught because Pharaoh had already claimed earlier, who is the Lord that I should obey him? I know not the Lord. And so the Lord is showing through these plagues that I am the Lord God. Now after God executed his first judgment, we see that the Nile was uh, absolutely fatal to all the creatures that lived within it. 
You see the river, which was regarded as the giver and sustainer of life, was now a place of death, no longer able to give or support that for which it was revered. We also see that the river of blood flowed through the land for seven days. Seven days, if you think about it, was the length of time that was given to the inhabitants of the land of Jericho. You'll find that in Jericho chapter 6 verses 3 and 4 to repent. You see, God gave Pharaoh and the Egyptians seven days to consider what was happening here. But alas, there was no sign of repentance ever seen. You see, the Nile had become a place of death and the stench of death engulfed the land. When you think about it, God had spent seven days in creating life and resting in it. And here, God takes seven days to show that sin had made his absolutely fine creation a place of death. Now, when you think about the water turning into blood, as I said before, it speaks of death. You see, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death. This is a clear warning from God, from God about the impending doom and judgment. We find a similar warning in Revelation chapter 6 and verse 12. There we find that the moon turning into blood red. You see, the water turning into blood reminds us just like water can be a savor of life to those who are thirsty and who use it responsibly. But it can also be a savor of death as in cases like in drowning. So to the word of God that is referred in the scripture as the water of the word can be a savor of death unto death as well as a savor of life unto life. We can also contrast this with the first miracle which the Lord Jesus did in Cana of Galilee where he turned the water into wine. And this is also a contrast of the two dispensations, the dispensation under Moses and the dispensation under the Lord Jesus Christ. We read of the old dispensation that the law was given through Moses. But under the new dispensation, we find that grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. John's Gospel, chapter 1, verse 17 says so. Now this brings to an end the study of these few verses. May God bless you and keep you and I trust that this study of this small portion was as much a blessing and encouragement to you as it was to me. The Lord bless his word to each one of our hearts for the Lord Jesus' sake.